Yeah. Just a clarifying question. Uh, in those trials, like the last example of the quadratic, yeah. uh, were the, the data that were transmitted to the next person, were they the results during the training or after the training? They were the after training, the predictions. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, you said that the fees, uh, this is really, really interesting as well. Um, is it the case, so you, you contrasted the observational learning where you follow the model around and observe that versus something more like teaching. Um, right. in the, but is, does it have to be the case that these uh, the theories or hypotheses or whatever are communicated? So, I mean, imagine that right. the learner has an inferential process that, I mean, so what I'm wondering is, I mean, it's, Intuitively, it seems like um, ratcheting cultural evolution, what's required for it is structured representations where there's structuring and representation that allows the accumulation to, right. to, to occur. Yeah. But if, if you have an inferential process in the learner where um, yeah. it allows them to right. generate new hypotheses mm -hmm. that then they get data from the, from, from the uh, right. model without necessarily teaching. Is yeah. that would well, that also produce? Yes, that's right. So what, what you need is a mechanism for putting your posterior distribution in my head. And that mechanism could be on the teacher side or the right. learner side. Okay. Right? Um, and yeah, so I was, I mean, it, so I, I, I call these observational learning and, you know, um, theory transmission, but it's really, you know, mixed data and posterior passing, right, are the things that we're mathematically analyzing. Right. You can have a more powerful observational learning mechanism that might allow you to get that you know, appropriate distribution of the perfect degrees of certainty in your head, but it's kind of a challenge. And right, so, right. if you can show me one of those, then everything can work out. Okay. Teaching um, isn't quite what. Uh, so we're we're now doing experiments which are about teaching, where instead of people just typing something in a box and knowing that that's going to be used by the next person, we're getting them to, to yeah to. And in fact, we're doing it somewhere as a compromise between these two cases, where they're generating observations. So the idea is you could have observational learning but your model could be selecting the observations in a way that is going to give you an appropriate posterior distribution, right? And so that's the case we're looking at, where people can actually choose, they're going to tr transmit five ob observations, and we say, choose the five that you think are going to be most helpful to the next person who's learning about this function. Um, and then we tell the next person, these are the five that have been chosen that they think are the most helpful for figuring out this function. And then they see those, and, and yeah. so, as long as there's a sort of pedagogical mechanism that can get the appropriate representations in the head, then that'll be okay. Yeah. What did people actually write in the box? Yeah, it's kind of interesting. So we analyzed it. So our hope was that expressing uncertainty, right, would, would correlate with success, but it correlates with failure. <laughs> so, um, you know, saying things like, um, so we, we coded a bunch of different things, but uh, expressing multiple hypotheses was not something that people tended to do. So it was more that what people did was um, kind of, it's something that you can analyze as passing on posterior information, but it wasn't passing on posterior information. So what they would do is basically provide something that would provide a constraint. So saying, I think that it increases until you get to the middle of the screen, or I guess it decreases until you get to the middle of the screen. And then someone could figure out the other one. But in some ways that is posterior passing in that you are constraining the posterior distribution to now only give mass to those things that are, you know, decreasing on that side of the screen. But it wasn't explicitly done as posterior passing. Yeah. So I'd like to get step back and get interested from the laboratory. So the problem I like to think about is well, problems that kind of like to think about is how do people learn facts about the ecology that they're living in? how you make different kinds of technology and so on, which it's not very plausible that there's a nativist prior. I mean, there can't be a prior that tells you how to make a bow, for example, and you make pieces of it somehow, or you know, a mechanical causation prior or something. But, so the space of, of priors, or the, the, the space of objects is immense, right? way too big. And empirically, I think what happens is people, it's as if they, I mean, so you get, how, how, how do bows evolve? How do kayaks evolve? How do they evolve? Well, people, they make local trials, right? They, 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 they observe, and then they, and then they, so it's as if they, they have a, a predisposition to make their prior be centered at whatever they see, and then, and 
And the space is too big yet, probably the whole thing. So does that is that Clark's question all over again, or? Uh, um, well, it's, I mean, so maybe th yeah. Somehow the behavior is getting right. Pr 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 distributional information into the learner's head. Right? Yeah. But, but. Uh, so I think the question is. So I, I mean, I think that general sort of framework is consistent with what I was talking about here, where. It's not that you're passively receiving data, but you're generating data, right? By your interventions on the world and figuring out what works and what doesn't work. So think about it in terms of trying to estimate. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So like, the, the person is, you know, makes, or or they're just observing the effects of chance right. variations. Right. You know, I couldn't find that kind of word. So. Right. So that part is still consistent, I think, with this sort of framework. I think the bigger question is, what is it that they're transmitting that's allowing them to accumulate? I mean, it might be that the physical artifacts are actually a big part of. You know, like if you can see the variation that exists in the things that people have produced that work, that's actually a pretty powerful, you know, guide to yeah. But I mean, there's lots of counterexamples. I mean, so so in this island where uh, Johanna and I work, um, people know that uh, that particular tissues in particular kinds of fish are poisonous, and um, uh, it, we now. They've known this for a long time. Uh, science has learned in the last 25 years that there's a fat soluble toxin that builds up in, in nervous system tissue of big predators along with creatures like turtles. Now, of course, they don't have this causal story, but they know you shouldn't eat turtles, especially if you're pregnant. And, and there's no object to, right. to look at there. Right. This is uh, uh, how, uh, so it's it's it's. Yeah, well, another way of thinking about this is that um, I think this kind of, you know, what I was calling observational learning is something that could operate even if you didn't have language or any other sort of medium for transmission. It's something you could get just by watching what somebody does. So an interesting question to ask is whether you think that those things could continue to be transmitted if there wasn't a way of sort of passing those on as facts or sort of assertions. Um, and there might be a another way of getting at some of those systems. I mean, I, I think the way that I interpret these results is, is more about indicating that um, we have to have some mechanism which is more sophisticated than just like, you know, observing data in a passive sort of, you know, a, a accumulation of data from these different sources kind of way. Um, and it might be that that mechanism is something which is linguistic, it might be it's something pedagogical, it might be, there are lots of different things that I think can operate on different scales and in different cases in order to produce that kind of thing. I, I guess I'm asking the question because it seems to me that the attractive thing about this whole approach is you have a way of, of representing the, the, and, you know, all the stuff that people gather along and myself included about for years about biases and this right. kind of thing. So, so I mean, you actually have a, a way of... Uh, or a class of biases, inductive biases, right? Yeah, but, but I, yeah. I can see how you might... I mean, so the question is, how can, how can you extend this framework to right. take into account these things which, I mean, by my way of thinking, you know, why we learn in the first place. Yeah. We're, we're good at adapting to this very wide range of environments in a way that other animals aren't. So this is the trick, is to understand how this works, both at the population level, but also cognitively. It seems to me that yeah. you've got a way of thinking about the cognitive part of it more coherently. Yeah. Well, I could tell you, I mean, we can talk some more yeah. about this offline, but I mean, the, the kinds of things we're looking at now are how do you give an analysis of pedagogy and what does it change about the way that learning works? And we've got a, a nice story about that where what happens is it changes, um, you know, it changes both the way in which data is generated and the inferences that you draw from those data because you're making an assumption that the data you're generating should be particularly good for communicating the hypothesis that you want to communicate. And if the learner makes that assumption too, those, that pair of assumptions becomes a much more effective way of transmitting information. And so that's why we're now doing these pedagogy experiments, is to test that. Yeah? Um, I was wondering if you could mention a little, talk a little bit more about the, um, the idea that you have with Simon Kirby about language universals. Uh -huh. so right. Pass by a little quick, but um, does that depend on um, so how, how, um, how does that depend on, uh, or does it, on the structuring of the populations in terms of um, how cultural variants are transmitted? Does it require the cultural equivalent of gene flow across populations in order to get those universals? So, uh, so the idea is that um, when you can think about 
However, so the, the idea, in order to connect to universals, right, you have to imagine there are many of these chains going on. And the reason why it makes a prediction about universals is it says, regardless of where those chains start out, they could all start out at the same place and diverge. They could start out in different places. But regardless of where they start out, you're going to get to a point where the distribution over solutions that you end up with is going to reflect the prime. So the prediction, the way you translate that into a statement about universals is that it says that if you look across societies, the distribution of things you expect to see mm -hmm. should come to reflect that distribution that's inside people's heads, right? And how is that different than the Chomsky view? It's, so the, the way that it's, uh, so I think the way I think about it is I've got a result for the East Coast and a result for the West Coast. So you can choose which one you want. So the, the East Coast result mm -hmm. is sampling. You get a one-to-one -one correspondence between inductive biases and the distribution of things across societies, right? Right? If you, if you, that was what I thought about. Um, the West Coast result is, as you move towards maximizing, transmission can magnify the effect of inductive biases. Mm -hmm. So that means that you don't that you start with whatever the universals are, and then you back way off, right? Because it could be that those things are produced just by a very weak bias in one direction or another. Right. So yeah. the the basic result you know, the whiteboard here. But no, if you we don't have one. if you um uh not enough math in this room. We can so <laughs> we can prove that I mean the sort of the cases that we can prove things about are restrictive cases, but in those cases you can prove that as you exponentiate the posterior, the distribution you converge to is an exponentiated prime. So what so as, as the exponent goes to infinity, then you're just deterministically choosing the, the hypothesis that has the highest posterior probability, right? As the exponent is between one and infinity, you're just exaggerating whatever the, so you're moving towards maximizing. Okay. Um, and so that means that okay, let's say I observe some distribution, then I should take the you know exponent root of that probability distribution, and that's going to be much much closer to uniform, you know, in, and that would be whatever the prior would be that would yeah. produce that outcome. So that's, so that's the result that Simon likes, because Simon wants to say those properties that we see across languages are just a consequence of the relatively general purpose learning mechanisms that people use. Right? And so the way that I think about it, I'm not even worried about the East Coast version, because yeah. even if it turns out that there has to be a one-to-one -one correspondence, it tells you that that correspondence is something that could be relatively arbitrary. Right? That, you know, we're, we're, because, culture, because language is a culturally transmitted object, then it's going to come to reflect something. Right. These are just the things that happen to reflect, right. and yes, those are the things that matter for learning language because those are the things that sure. are going to influence it. I mean, there's, there, I actually don't think it's that that worth defending Chomsky, but there's a reading of what Chomsky says that, that is, I mean, he is actually non-adaptationist right. about UG, right. and so what that means is that the um, he, he has, the priors of UG could be arbitrary yeah, uh, because right. they're not they haven't been tested against efficiency in the world. Yeah. I, I, I think his views are a little more right. It's a little, I think it's that he he has a non adaptationist argument for origins, but he thinks of it as an acceptation. Yeah. So there is room for um, you know some tuning. Yeah. Right. But what I was going to focus in on more was the question of universals across languages. So if you think uh, obviously there's some transmission of there's borrowing of words, there's borrowing right. of syntactic. Yeah, that's um, right. Yeah, so we, this is completely whatever. isolated. But I mean, right. if you assume that at least yeah. at some level there's linguistic isolation, right. um, if you think of the priors as part of human nature or right. something, wherever they come from, then you can see how yeah. the process you're yeah. talking about, you get right. universality. But if, if the priors are just arbitrary cultural assumptions. You still get universality. But, How I mean, would you not get the analog of drift across the drift? Uh, so you would get because the priors never have an opportunity to change from the initial state. Yeah, right. And and they, but those priors could be something that's relatively generic that just gets emphasized through transmission. Right. Yeah. Um, we have another cool result which is sort of interesting, which is uh, we can analyze the convergence rate of these processes, and so we have a um, uh, result which suggests that in fact there has not been sufficient time to converge to the prior since the origin of language. If you assume a, so if you assume a single origin, then you could explain cross-linguistic similarities based on that unique origin. There's not been enough time in order to diverge. Like, in order to diverge to the point where the only thing that's influencing it is inductive biases. So that, again, that, that gives you another sort of way of thinking about relaxing the traditional Chomsky yeah. um, it's, it's kind of a, it's hard to make that kind of argument um, but what we can do is prove that for various grammatical formalisms, 
and in the range of sort of sizes of hypothesis spaces that linguists have asserted, then we get a convergence rate which is not consistent with that. And then all of the other factors that I, I sort of briefly mentioned about social structure and so on slow down the rate of change. So that gives us a, a bound on, on how much time has to pass. So I'm trying to figure out how to fit in various strange beliefs that humans have, which A, shouldn't really have an evolved prior at least because it's probably not adapted, and B, there's not, there's no reason that evidence in the world should support these beliefs, like magical beliefs in um, illness or various other sort of religious beliefs like that. So I. One way is that there could be a strong fire for believing these things, it's urgent beliefs. Another way is that once you are handed down that belief, all new data that you get, you interpret as supporting the hypothesis. Right. So there's no, all the new data basically is bad data because of the way that you, right. you encode it. So I'm wondering if you thought about that. Um, yeah, we thought a little bit about that. I mean, in terms of these results, like the the properties of the hypotheses don't matter much. The only thing that drives it is the prior probabilities. Um, that changes a little bit when you maximize, but in general, it's true. Um, but in the lab, we actually look at other things which are more along those lines, things like um, detecting random processes, right? So how you figure out whether something is just sort of purely random chance versus there being some underlying causal relationship. And one thing that's interesting about those kinds of things, and there are, you know, you can probably imagine that a lot of superstitious hypotheses might map onto some of those things. Um, one thing that's interesting is that those have a particular kind of asymmetry in the kind of evidence that you can get, where you can only ever get weak evidence for something being completely random, but it's very easy to get strong evidence that goes in the other direction, even if the thing that you're seeing is something which is a random process. So. You could, uh, you might need to appeal to, so basically what that means is that any sort of approximation which is sensitive to the distribution of evidence in terms of approximations of these kind of Bayesian inferences is going to be something which can be affected by, like some, some hypotheses will be stickier than others as a consequence. So it might be something that could come out as a consequence of approximating Bayesian inference, or it could be something which, you know, is part of whatever the prize are, but I'm not sure about it. Yeah. Here, here, look at some uh, information being transmitted along the a linear chain, a yeah. one-dimensional yeah. chain. Which so you expect information to be lost, but right. in, in a more realistic social network, you would have yeah. something which would be highly dimensional, mm -hmm. and so you would, you know, in the language of statistical mechanics, you would expect to have a, a ordered state, in which, yeah. which could explain things like you know, myth, which which is not lost in spite of. Like the last question. Well, I mean, myth, myth goes, I mean, uh, you can argue about, so Bartlett's original argument was that um, myths are things that uh, in part are going to reflect our cultural biases and that's what allows them to survive in the forms that they do. So he actually would give a sort of prior based explanation for why certain mm -hmm. kinds of things differ and others don't. Um, but I did briefly mention, so this is an interesting result. Kenny Smith showed this. Uh, it's, it's what you expect. Um, Basically, when you have people learning from multiple teachers, you no longer have linear dynamics. So you can get bifurcations and other kinds of things happening. So you, you can get, uh, you get bifurcations based on basically the composition of the population. So if you have, say, someone who's learning from you know, um, uh, three teachers, then uh, what happens is um, you, uh, you, the prior has a small effect on, in terms of what the proportions in the population need to be in order to determine the equilibria, but the equilibria are, you know, always speaking exactly one language, right? Like the entire population converges to speaking one language, because that population structure where you're learning from multiple people enforces a kind of homogeneity. Um, and so that's kind of what you're saying, you get greater stability when you have, like, the greater connectedness. Um, so we have this interesting result, which is that um, if you have, like, multilingual learners, then you get back the original result. And the reason why is that, I need a whiteboard again. Um, so what happens is, it, uh, it means that languages evolve rather than, you know, languages evolve individually. So in the current model, there's sort of one hypothesis inside your head. But if you can have multiple hypotheses inside your head, that might be coming from multiple people, 
those hypotheses can evolve independently. And for any one hypothesis, you can trace the chain back and you can analyze the chain and then you get a full product. There's just a, it's just that what's going on is that each person is kind of being a host for multiple languages rather than for one. And so there are, you know, it, there's this trade-off between kind of flexibility on the part of the learner in terms of how complex their representation is of what they're learning and the complexity of the social structure in determining the equilibrium. I, if I have a whiteboard, I can show you what happens. So um, in the sort of take-home message part, you, you um, perhaps preaching not to the anthropologists, but to the cognitive scientists, you said, so this is a, a different tool for arriving at uh, yeah. an understanding of yeah. inductive reasoning. Um, it seems to me, if I were a conventional American cognitive psychologist, I'd be pretty distressed about this. And the reason <laughs> is that um, yeah, you, you, were, you were to some of my talks before. <laughs> Theory of mind. Um, if you were careful to point out that priors can come from anywhere. Right. right? Uh, your typical uh, cognitive psychologist thinks that she's studying the way the mind works um, and that the mind should work the same way everywhere. Right? Um, uh, results like your uh, color experiment are interesting, but of course, there are a bunch of biological priors in yeah, there. Yeah, and that's actually the argument that we're making, because we, we're only using English speakers, right? So sure. the idea is if we can replicate those things with English speakers, then it reflects general learning. Sure, sure. Yeah. But so you, you know, you draw on some, I don't know, Kahneman and Tversky style, uh, well-established bias, right? Um, and uh, there's nothing in the result that tells you whether or not this is the way that the human mind writ large works or whether this is something, and you sort of alluded to this, whether this is what a psychological anthropologist would call part of the ethos, right? That right. is, that, that um, as Bartlett argued, right, that there are themes in cultures, right. and those themes are mutually reinforcing, and, and processes like the ones that um, you're talking about will lead to homogenization with regard to those themes. And so you can get very robust results that are, in fact, parochial unless you start sampling more broadly. Yep. Yep. So uh, I agree with all of that. So um, uh, we're doing cross-cultural. One, I have, there's a graduate student I'm working with at Berkeley, Sai Wing Yun, who's doing. A, um, he has a nice cross-cultural version of the functional learning experiment, looking at um, uh, American college students versus he has a Chinese college student population, and um, apparently. This is something which uh, had been shown in the literature before that extrapolating functions, if people in, uh, you know, in China were more likely to extrapolate in a way which was not linear, but sort of flat. They would expect things to kind of return to a, a more of a sort of stable equilibrium state, whereas Americans are like, it's going up. <laughs> um, uh, and so that's what we find in that experiment. So it's definitely like the macroeconomists the, the, right. already knew this. <laughs> right. Uh, so so that's something where you know you can. I, I think that's right. So it's a tool for exploring. If you think the cultural you know biases are relevant to a task, then you can reveal what those cultural biases are. If you think it's general purpose learning memory biases, you can reveal what those things are. You know that's the. It's really. There are multiple ways in which those biases could appear. We only get what we're measuring in the lab in that task. And I wouldn't want to generalize and say, this kind of res result is the consequence of you know, some kind of general bias to expect positive learning functions, right? It's just what we know about that task. Can we type one more? Um, I was wondering whether in your experiment there, people were transmitting the theory whether if you allow people to look at the relative success of the people, uh -huh. uh, whether that will create the same dynamics. Or yeah, uh, I think it would change it, but I have to think hard about how it would change it. But that's exactly getting at some of these points about who you choose to be your model, right? Um, and uh, I think you know you'd expect that to have an effect, and um, and I just I'm not really. Uh, you guys can probably figure out what that effect would look like. Um, uh, yeah, we've not really done the um, any. We've done a couple of experiments where there's more of group interaction, but really just focusing on these chain cases and, and not thinking about selection, just thinking about transmission. But I, I agree that would be a, a good place to go if you wanted to figure out. How. But you'd say that it's the same thing. Basically, you're transmitting the 
Uh, I don't know what I would say because you you're transmitting information. By so what would happen is, based on how well I think you're doing, I would say, well, I think I can do better than that. I'm going to ignore the information you gave me, or you were doing really well. I'm going to pay close attention to the information you gave me. So it, it would influence how you would weight the data that you were getting, and in principle, you know that should make things better, right? In terms of uh, getting towards the truth, because you're not going to. You, you can reset appropriately rather than just being confused by whatever the previous person has done. All right, thank you. Yeah.